Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. And a little more casual today. Got glasses on. It's a We're recording this on a Saturday morning. So what do you expect? But uh, I am so happy to have my guest with me today. And I love it when we can do podcast mashups. And we're doing another one again today. He is the host of the Beyond the Rut podcast. And you can find that wherever you find podcasts. He's also an Army veteran. A great guy, and I was honored to be on his podcast here not so long ago. So I wanted him to come on our podcast and share his story with you. He's my friend Jerry Dugan and joins me today on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Jerry, how you doing today, man? Brian, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on this show. I am excited to have you here, man. I've been looking forward to our conversation. And I want to start here with you because I, I, I've, I've, for the last, and we're up to, to well- by the time this releases, we're going to be near 170 episodes, official episodes, probably mm-hmm. close to 180 released episodes nice. and things like that. But I've asked people just about on every episode as we continue to navigate through what we're navigating through with the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to ask you, what, does, what has that been like for you and your family? Because you're in, you're in the Dallas area. I'm in West Virginia. We've had different experiences around COVID-19. What has it been like for you and your family? And I want to know the lesson that you've learned from it or your biggest takeaway from from what you've gone through personally, professionally, things like that with the pandemic. Nice. Um, so I guess I need to kick this off with a disclaimer uh, because I do currently work for a healthcare organization and uh, they'll probably freak out if I start answering without saying it. Uh, but it's everything that I say, right? I'm here, in the pharmaceutical you know, industry, so don't worry about it. Yeah. So, you know, you know about these. And here's my cat. This is Bradley. Um, if you're watching wise, on YouTube, his cat just photobombed our, our broadcast. Yes. So not, not a problem <laughs> at all. He's the, uh, of the three cats I have, he's the ADHD one. And uh, he's like, if I were a cat, that would be the form. And I think he's about to attack the cat. <laughs> this guy just a side note hasn't bothered me for the last hour while I was setting up and getting ready for this. But now that we're recording, he's like, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to mess with this um, light over here. And so I'm just going to reach over, fix this light real quick. And I'll be back on topic here and you, you, magic of editing. Well, you know, the thing about it is, and, and you know, that I, I love what, what, you know, we have a cat and, and she's older and there are times that she just disappears and it's like, has anybody seen the cat? And there are times that, she, you know, <laughs> she, I tell you when she doesn't disappear, Jerry, is first thing in the morning when it's time for her to be fed. Then she oh, just, yeah. I, I mean, that's the most animated that she gets all day. Like it's time to feed me. And it's like, it's like raising a child all over again. It's like, I thought we were done with this when our son was able to feed himself. Yeah. No, the <laughs> cat, the cat has decided that they're going to just, you know, I'm like, just hush, wait a minute. Or if I get up to go to the restroom in the middle of the night, she's like, oh, it's time to get up and feed me. No, it's not time to get up and feed you. I want 20 more minutes, you know? Yeah. But, oh, man. but yeah, so, but, <laughs> But I, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you made that disclaimer because again I feel like a lot of people in the healthcare industry and I know a lot of nurses and people in the healthcare industry everyone has had a different experience around mm-hmm. it and, and and I believe this it, it's been geographical in nature because we haven't Jerry we haven't seen the things here in West Virginia that they've seen in New York City. Oh yeah, yeah. And I and I had I had a, a gentleman on my podcast a, a while a little while back that talked about having his mom be in healthcare in New York City. Mm-hmm. We were not in a true uh danger zone hot spot if you will. West Virginia because of our population size, we just were never in that that really high 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 risk 
population. We have 1.8 million people in the whole state. There's a suburb <laughs> of your, there's a suburb of Dallas that's bigger than. But what yeah. I'm saying is, everyone's experience is different. So again, I'll I'll I'll, ref, I'll go here with you. From a personal standpoint, what's the biggest thing you've learned or taken away? Yeah. From the pandemic. Um, yeah. Now that we're not distracted by my cats anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we already did the disclaimer. You know, what I say is my own opinion, not whoever I work for at the time. Yeah. Uh, and so with my own personal experience, uh, the takeaways were also different in the sense that as of the time we're recording this, I'm still commuting between uh, my job in Dallas and my family that's over 350 miles away. So I took a job totally against my usual uh, mantra of, you know, I will never select a job over family. And uh, I had done this in November 2019 because uh, I was already looking ahead to a year later when my wife and I would become empty nesters. So I was looking at life beyond raising children. And I wanted to set that stage for my wife and I with a nice career, uh, career progression, but really for that to support the life I envisioned for my wife and I, which was us being able to have the freedom to travel and so on. So I move up there to Dallas. Um, I didn't understand why I needed to go there. I just knew my wife knew that I needed to go. So it was one of those like leap of faith type of things like go forth. You'll, you'll find out why when you get there. And so from November until about March, I am struggling, Brian, with why did I do this? This I'm separated from my family for a job. This goes totally against everything I am about. And then the order from the city of Dallas comes down that we are on a lockdown, that we are at community spread for the pandemic. This is March, 2020. And the, the precautions put into place really sounded like an emergency. And I thought, wow, this is serious. Like I need papers to travel from work to my apartment three blocks away. Or if I go grocery shopping, I, you know, shopping and uh, some of those requirements there. And, uh, and I just took a deep breath, you know, uh, and there goes Bailey attacking my camera. She's sniffing it out. So I got to, I got to <laughs> ask you this. Let me jump in here and ask. Yeah. This. So you, you move 350 miles away to Dallas. Yeah. And now, for the first time in a long time, you're living by yourself. And I've done that a little bit in traveling and for, for work and things like that. You know, at least, you know, I can remember a few years back, I was on the, I would leave on Monday and get home on Thursday. So for three, three, four days a week, I was by my, I was living by myself. Now, granted, I was living yeah. in a hotel room in different places. But I was living by myself. I was eating dinner when I wanted to eat dinner. I, I was doing, going to bed when I wanted to go to bed, things like that. For you now, you transplant your life. And I don't know how much you got to go home between November and March, if it was every weekend or every other weekend. But what was that like for you transplanting yourself away from the day-to-day -day family life and, and basically being a bachelor all over again? Yeah, that took some growing pains alone because uh, my wife and I were used to being around each other every single day. Um, and so there were some adjustments. Like I would call home and, you know, they're out doing family stuff so they couldn't talk to me at the time. Or I would be connecting with some friends of mine in the Dallas area. And so I wouldn't be able to answer right away. And, and so there were just some some initial conflicts, some initial frustrations. Uh, but we started to get into a group. We're like, okay. We, we got to have some set times where we talk to each other, uh, some, some rules around when do we reach out and so on. And, and so we were just starting to get into that. And I was able to go home every week or two. And uh, so that was starting to fall into place. And we were starting to realize, okay, this isn't going to last so long. But again, when that lockdown came, it was now indefinite because I'm in like one of the concentrations of uh, COVID spread in the state of Texas. So there is a, a real risk that my exposure by working in a hospital or just going into the community to get groceries uh, or just hunt for a toilet paper. Um, yeah, like I couldn't bring that back to my family. I uh, never thought that webcams and toilet paper would be obsolete here in West. <laughs> right. <Virginia>. You know, <laughs> or never... onions. 
Yeah, it, well, we onions. we didn't have a problem with onions because we have ramps here. We, we grow ramps here in West oh, okay. Virginia, which is a type of onion. But webcams and toilet paper, my man, got hard to source. And and oh, yeah. when you do a podcast and your webcam crashes and you need one pretty immediately, it, it, it it's a tough road to hoe. But, you know, yeah, you were talking about getting groceries and things like that. How were your family, what was it like back home? around what they were dealing with as well too and and how did you kind of make both worlds fit together how did you let me ask it this way how did you separate what you were going through there you were you were in a in a a really tough spot they're yeah. 350 miles away probably not nearly feeling the 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 same things on a day-to-day -day basis as you were yeah, because I, I had yeah, I had friends that were 350 miles away and it was night and day difference between here and there. And so yeah. I, I can only imagine what that was like. What was it like for you kind of monitoring things, being being totally immersed in your situation there, but but trying to figure out what was going on back home? Yeah, uh, in a lot of ways, for my wife and I, at least uh, early in our marriage, I was deployed to Iraq. Uh, actually to uh, Kuwait and then we invaded Iraq. So for us in a lot of ways, it was just like being on deployment again. Uh, so nostalgia, but not for the right reasons. And uh, so we, we kind of just reminded ourselves of that. Remember when you went to Kuwait and uh, communications were spotty and then you did the invasion and I didn't hear from you for a month or for 21 days, actually yeah, about a month. And I was like, yeah. And, and so the difference here was that we were able to talk to each other every day. So we, we at least counted our blessings in that respect. Like, you know, at least, you know, cause I couldn't go home for about a month when this thing kicked off and cause we needed to see how the spread was going to happen. Am I going to get it? Um, what kind of protocols are in place to protect us as we travel back and forth? And so the, the blessings that we would count were that uh, our family was safe. So my, my son, my daughter, uh, and my wife are in our home in Corpus Christi and they're safe. They're isolating, they're limiting their, their excursions out into the community. Uh, when they do go out, they're wearing masks, they're doing hand hygiene, you know, they're state, they're paying attention to the news. And then we're able to check in with each other throughout the day. And since I worked in a hospital as, you know, recommendations were coming down uh, from the CDC to the local like physicians and then disseminated to us, I was able to kind of keep my family abreast of like, hey, here's what's going on uh, across the country here locally. Uh, here's some of the projections we got for Texas. So we were actually in a better state communication wise than if you were to roll back the clock to 2003, where it was my wife, a one year toddler, one year old toddler, my son, and my daughter was on the way because my wife was pregnant at the time. Very night and day situation. Well, Jerry, so we, yeah. let me jump in there. I love what you said about the information you had, because I would have to feel like in your situation that you, you were looking for advantages to connect your family. I, at least I, I would. And, and you have an advantage with the information that you're able to gather probably literally on an hour by hour basis. Oh yeah. Yeah. As things were developing, you could keep your wife abreast and you could say, look, here's the guidance we're getting. It's probably going to get to Corpus Christi at some point, but you're going to have a, you're going to be prepared before it gets there. Like yeah. everybody else is going to hear this firsthand and you're going to go, I already know we're already prepared. We know what to do. Was that a comfort for you to be able to share that with her and know that she would know how to take that information? Because you talk, you've talked deployment a couple times, mm -hmm. and I like that. Were you was that a comfort for you to be able to give her that information and know that she was going to deploy the information you gave her and be more prepared than people around her? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and very much like that deployment in 2003, uh, I was able to carry on my mission in Dallas uh, as a civilian <laughs> because I knew that my family was okay at home. And um, because, I mean, one of the first thoughts through my head when this lockdown hit and we realized the pandemic is here in Texas is, oh shoot, 
I need to go home. Do I need to go home? Can I go home? And so the lockdown actually prevented me from going home because uh, not from a physically you, you, you're going to stop me, but uh, from a moral obligation. Like yeah. if I've been exposed, I cannot take that. I cannot be the guy that brings it to Corpus Christi. Let some other, you know, some other traveler do that. Yeah, you don't uh, want to be, you know, <laughs> you don't want to be on the, the post office walls going, you know, <laughs> you know, if you see this guy, arrest him. He's the he's the super spreader of Corpus yeah. Christi. <laughs> Patient <laughs> zero in Corpus. That's yeah, it, that's Agent it. Zero. That's exactly right. So so I'm gonna go here just for a minute and we'll step aside and take a break. And I love I love the color that you've provided around that. Mm -hmm. But here's what I want to ask you. You just said that that it was a lot like for you. You were a civilian, you know, kind of kind of calling on your past experience. Yeah, you had been in chaotic situations like that before. Um, you know, literally seeing an enemy that could do you harm at any moment, and we'll we'll get to to the bulk of that story later. Do you feel like? And and I want to I want to go here again with you. Did you feel like that your experience a, as a veteran helped you navigate through what we were going through because you had been in unknown missions before? You had yeah. been in situations where you were literally you took off on an airplane, and the next thing you know, the next time your feet touched soil, you were you were halfway around the world. Yep. And so w did you feel like your experience helped you navigate the uncertainty of what everybody else was going through? 100%. Yeah. Um, in fact, the most common thing I heard, so the moment we realized, okay, this, this is coming down hard. Um, we had a scramble. My department does learning and development for a healthcare system with about 8,500 employees. So that's my current job as of while we're talking. Uh, and we had to scramble because we still had a demand to fill our ranks with nurses. We need nurses, especially now. Uh, we need to keep the flow of new employees coming in. So my department, who's in charge of new employee orientation, needed to make some adaptations. So how do we orient 50 people a week when the CDC guidance is no more than 10 people to a room? And so I applied my, my work history with this like there's chaos the information is changing every hour it felt like or at least every day and not just the information from the cdc our interpretation of it at the city level and our interpretation of it at the hospital level all those factors were changing and adjusting and because of my military background i was able to take that information in and say okay the commander's intent is still the same we need to orient new employees we need to be able to do it with you know minimal contact so what are the resources we have available? All right, team, this is what we need to develop. Let's go for it. Uh, we got four days to do it. Oh, you guys have never done this before. Great. Practice on this tool over here. I need to go into a meeting over here because we need a process to get people in. Uh, so my boss has taken me into a meeting with executives. And so total chaos, lots of change. And, and the number one thing that my boss kept saying to me or asking me was, Jerry, how are you staying so calm about this? And I remember just looking at him and saying, uh, Steve, no one's trying to kill me. Yeah. And he just looked at me and said, what? And he goes, and I, and I told him everything is exactly the way I would experience it on a deployment to combat, except there's nobody out there with a gun or bombs or artillery trying to kill me and keep me from going home to my family. And everything we have going on right now is with a purpose. So I've got clarity right now and i know what our team needs to work on what they need to learn i know where i need to help you and support you to support our organization as a whole and so i mentioned at the very beginning that i made this move in november 2019 without any understanding why why did god tell me put it on my heart you are going to dallas and i didn't just put it on your heart jerry because i didn't put it on your heart at all i put it on your wife's heart i put it on your friend's heart who recommended you i put it on your boss's heart uh, at your old organization who said you need to go for this i put it on everybody's heart around you to convince you to go and so march 2020 as my team is scrambling in four days time to go from an in-person orientation to a fully online asynchronous, uh, which means self-paced, do it whenever you can, uh, uh, with tracking and processes in place. Um, 
it turns out I was the only one in my organization with the skill sets to guide that and wow. make that happen. And so because of that, this organization with four hospitals, about 100 clinics, had a game plan to keep its mission going forward. Not only that, I was able to coordinate with my old organization because even though we're in the same town, we're not competing in the same market. So we were able to swap information. And the approach that I took to how we did orientation now allowed an organization with 40,000 employees across three or four countries continue their operations because of what I was doing. And so it was just like a Joseph moment. Like I was sent ahead, not just to establish a path into empty nesterhood with my wife and I, I was sent ahead because of this moment where we were going to have to keep our operations going at a hospital and help another organization. I was just like mind blown that that's one of the reasons why I was placed there without understanding why. So um, I had that kind of clarity all in the first week of the pandemic. And I was like, all right, God, I got this. This is so, th that is so cool, man. Because again, you have no, you, you just know that this is the next thing. Yeah. You don't know why it's the next thing. And that, that is so beautiful. Let's step aside, take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about Jerry's podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you see his shirt that says, ask me about my podcast. So we're going to ask him about his podcast called the Beyond the Rut podcast. And we're going to get into more of that. And later, we're going to tell his story. He's he's teased it a little bit about being deployed to Iraq. And so we're going to get into that part of his story. My guest, the host of the Beyond the Rut podcast, Jerry Dugan, joining me today on the Intentional Encourager podcast, back in just a moment. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton here. I want to tell you about our sponsor, SEO National. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Now, what's that, you might say? Well, Search Engine Optimization helps you show up higher on search engines in front of paying customers for words that you as a business owner can monetize. What a great concept. SEO National is owned by my good buddy, Damon Burton, who's been a guest here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Not only has Damon and his team worked with businesses of all sizes, from e-commerce startups to NBA teams and Shark Tank featured businesses, but more importantly, Damon and his team are about transparency, trust, and providing lifetime value. So much so that he still has his first customers after opening SEO National 14 years ago. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and call Damon and his team today at 855-736-6285 or go to www.seonational.com and get a free quote. Jerry, you and I are both podcasters and you know, people say, well, you must like talking to yourself a lot. I would talk to, <laughs> I've been talking to myself since I was a kid. How do you think I learned the art of conversation? And, 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 and trust me doing live radio as I've done live radio filling in for the past 19 years, uh, you talk to a microphone and, and a producer may or may not be listening to what you say. And, uh, it, it's, it's, but I'm my own producer now with the intentional encourager podcast. Well, my son helps out some, but, um, but anyway, I, podcasting is different. What led you, I know for me, what, what led me in, in the podcasting, what led you into podcasting? Nice. Um, so many, many years ago, well, no, I'm kidding. It was uh, eight years ago. <laughs> um, I had a blog. Four score and seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> For millions of years, we've been yes. reading books. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, gosh. Okay. So uh, about eight years ago, I had a, a blog called The Real Jerry Dugan, uh, therealjerrydugan.com. And it was about sharing authentic uh, manhood, Christian manhood. And so what, were my, what was my journey and the lessons learned about being a Christian husband, a, a Christian father? And I realized that my personality style is that of an extrovert. So I prefer extroversion. Uh, I get jazzed up by interacting with other people. Whether I know you or not, you become my friend. Uh, and it blows my, my, my wife's mind because she prefers introversion. So if there's a stranger, you stay away. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? My name's Jerry. And, and then we start talking at like the grocery store. Uh, so I just realized that you know, writing is hard, but talking for me is a little bit easier uh, because I also like to do external processing to get my thoughts out there. 
And, you know, I also at the time had it on my heart to be a motivational speaker. So how do I showcase the speaking ability, uh, get my message out there and not have to edit my grammar. And then th that's when it hit me. Hey, you listen to podcasts, start a podcast. So I, I pitched the idea. Yeah, You know my, what this, yeah. you know what the, you know what the first th thought of the intentional courage podcast was, it, mm. it was going to be thoughts from my backside. <laughs> Cause I was just going to pull it out of, you know, pull it out of, uh, of my rear or something like yes. that, you know, or, <laughs> or, or, you know, my initials are BS, you figure it out, you know, <laughs> but no, I, and, and the reason I, I say that is, is, is you're right. Podcasting is the new blogging. Yeah. It, it is, it is a way for you. And I tell people this all the time, Jerry, and I want to get your thoughts around this. When I, when, when I release an episode and, and, and I'll tell my guests, I'll say, hey, share it with your network. And the reason is not to get more exposure. I'm going to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit, at least yeah. for me. My, my, the reason that we do a YouTube channel, the reason that I tell my guests, share this with your network is this. It is a more powerful connection when you can see someone talking and you can see someone telling their story and you can hear it in their own words. That's why Audible has exploded because people want to hear books read by the author. Mm, they want to yeah. hear the author's words. They, they, they not only want to see, they don't just want to see the author's words. They want to hear the voice inflection. They want to hear the author of the story telling it to them as though they're sitting right there. And, and I don't know if you do this or not. I don't mean to hijack this part of the conversation. I imagine that I've got a chair, an invisible chair sitting next to me in water and things like that. And I imagine as I'm talking to my guest, that that listener is sitting right next to me. And I want them to be intimately as part of the conversation as possible. So that's why we record on video. And that's why we record audio. Because people consume the medium differently. When you started podcasting, what was the biggest difference for you than writing? Because some people are more naturally inclined to be behind a keyboard. And they're better yeah. putting their thoughts in words instead of speaking. Some people are... are, are better speakers than writers for you. What was that conversion like? Uh, it was a lot easier because instead of having to do an outline, start filling in like with a rough draft and reading through it and realizing it sounds way off from what I'm trying to convey because the grammar struck and the structure of the paragraph and the structure of the, uh, the whole post, uh, is different than how you have a conversation. Uh, it just didn't feel natural for me as, or as natural as podcasting does. And then on top of that, the harder thing for me to showcase, because the reason why I got into podcasting uh, was I wanted to showcase an authentic relationship between father and child. So I had this whole idea of like my son, who was, I believe, 11 or 12 at the time. I, I wanted his interactions with me. So if he had questions to ask his dad, what would they be? What would my answer be? Uh, just unadulterated, not unadulterated, but like uncut, unscripted. This is my advice to my son based on the questions he's asking me. And that's just, I couldn't convey that in a blog post, but I could convey it through an actual conversation where you could tell I was not egging my son on or guiding him or leading him to say certain things. Like truly like hit record, let him ask. And I give my authentic response. Uh, now the problem with that is my son shot the idea down. He was like, do I have to? Yeah. My oh. son, my son came in one day and said, I'm going to start a rival podcast called the unintentional discourager. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Chris, my, my son's a junior in college now. And so, oh, yeah, man. he, he, I'm like, yeah, would you like to, I asked him the other night, Jerry, I'm like, you want to come on an episode? He's like, I decline. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. I mean, so I understand your son shooting it down because yeah. I, you know, I try to get my son involved and he wants to start a rival podcast, you know. Oh, man. See, now the benefit of having a backup child is that it's a backup. <laughs> I love it. My wife and I did my my wife and I took the the uh, the 
my wife and I took the NCAA basketball approach. The, the, most of the kids are one and done, you know, so that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, we've got two. So my son shot it down. He's the older one. My daughter, to this day, I still have no idea where she came out of, but she was like, Phew. did I hear you say podcast? I could be on your show. And she was nine, and she's pitching to me this, like, my show back to me as if it's her idea. And I'm like, yeah. Was she trying out for Shark Tank? Is that what uh, she was doing? (laughs) She wanted her own YouTube channel. She wanted her own YouTube channel. We said no because she's nine. Yeah. But if she's on a show that is endorsed by her dad, then there is no choice but to have her out there. So, yeah, she totally pitched the idea of a father-daughter show. And I was like, all right, cool. You might be onto something. And I thought I had some time to like research microphones and recording and how do you host this thing? She said, no, Hey, we'll meet in your room in 15 minutes. We'll record right away. And I'm like, what? We, we have no equipment. She goes, you have a phone. I'll show you how to use it. Dad. I know you're old. I was like, ah, oh, you were the favorite, but, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, we favorite son, favorite daughter. Uh, and so, yeah, we were recording the very first episode of Family Time Q&A podcast. Uh, she nailed me to the wall right away on the first episode to see if I really would honor my promise that the episodes would be unscripted, unedited. And they were. And so from there, it became the Family Time Q&A. We would rotate a family member every week. So my wife, my son, back to my daughter, and so on. And that went on for almost two years. And we did something like 86 episodes and uh, we eventually had to hang that up though, because, you know, my, my kids got busy with baseball, ballet and so on. And, and my wife was ferrying them around the, the city. Uh, so around that time, my friend Brandon Cunningham comes out of the woodwork and he's been listening to the show and he has it on his heart. He's an associate pastor at a church. And he says, Jerry, I, I want to start a podcast. I want to reach men. Um, and answer the same questions I'm getting every single weekend because it's the same work we've been doing in men's ministry at, at our, at the church when we attended together, but now I'm at this other church. It's the same questions every weekend. And I just thought we could kind of pull our resources together and get this message out there to inspire men, especially Christian men to pursue their dreams live outside the rut they feel stuck in without sacrificing their faith, their family, or their health. And I was like, let's do it. And so that's, that's why we started beyond the rut podcast. We even had a third guy that joined us because he, unlike myself is a great writer, really conveys his emotion through his writing. And he does it, I would say faster than I do and, and better. And, and so, yeah, it was the three of us, Sean, Brandon, myself, and we launched that show after nine months of arguing and deliberating and debating. We finally launched the show that was in 2015. And I kid you not, let's see, today's the 21st of August. Tomorrow is the sixth birthday of beyond the rut podcast. Uh, well, happy sh- birthday. BTR. Yeah. 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 Uh, I haven't figured out how I'm going to celebrate yet. Last year, I got a PodTrack P4. Um, this year, my wife said I've got enough equipment for now. So maybe yeah, I'll just settle for like Taco Bell or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, so six years later, the show is just me. Uh, Sean you know, went on to do other things early on in the, in the, in the episodes. Uh, Brandon, though, five years later, uh, has more responsibilities at his church than ever before. Plus he gained some grandchildren, which he didn't have five years ago. So when you look at priorities of life, you look at the essence of what our show is about and the messaging behind that show, it, it just made sense for him to step away and focus on those grandkids. Uh, so that that's also kind of the quick down and dirty of how and why Beyond the Rep began. And it essentially it is to help Christian men pursue their dreams without sacrificing their faith, their family, or their health. And there are five circles of life that we look at your faith, your family, your fitness, your finances, and your outlook on future possibility. And when all of those are working well, you've got a very fulfilled life. You've got purpose driving you. Now, if you start to pour too much into one area and, uh, and neglect another area of your life, the part that you're neglecting starts to negatively impact the rest. So let's say uh, you're pouring all your efforts into serving in ministry, but that means you're taking away time from your family. Well, that should be your number one mission field. If you're married with children, Yeah, that's your number one mission field. Yeah, your home. 100%. And yeah. And if you're out there serving other people, but not serving your home, then you lose your home, you lose your family. And that actually 
for a, a season at least degrades your impact in your ministry uh, because people are like, well, why are you talking to me? You're totally fake. You lost your family. You're ignoring your wife and you know, uh, that kind of thing. Or if your finances aren't there, then you feel stressed to do more work or uh, you argue with your family or you feel less inclined to give to your local church. Uh, and so having your finances in order actually frees you up to travel, to take your wife out on dates, to uh, support your children, like send them off to college, uh, to, to give, not just bring your tithe, which is expected, but to give to a cause, to give to a need that's presented in front of you. And when your finances are in order, you can do that. Or when your finances are in order, you can invest in the education needed to advance your, your career, your family. Well, I'll say this too. When your finances are, are in order, Jerry, you're able to survive things like we've been, like we've been talking about early in the, in, in the podcast, because, yeah. you know, let, let's say your income gets cut by 30%. If your finances are in order, you're, you're in a better position to be a, and, and I got to go here for just a second yeah. and, 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 and I, I want to get to your story and we will, we, but, but I want to go here with you for just a second. I hear people talking about inflation and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and what you just said is, is beautiful because now I, I want the two of us to talk to somebody maybe in that space right now. When you're ahead of the game, Inflation doesn't matter. When when you are preparing, and you talked about Joseph, mm -hmm. you, you said you had a Joseph moment. Yeah. The, the if you really study the life of Joseph, his impact on the nation of Egypt was the fact that while they had plenty, they stored it up. They weren't they weren't blowing money, so to speak. They were continuing to store up. That's what he was doing there was he was teaching them a system. No wonder you felt like you had a Joseph moment. He was teaching them to store up. Yeah. And, and, and in our society, what the pandemic should have taught a lot of us is we need to store up. We need to make sure that those things are in order so that, and my wife's real big about buying peanut butter. And she told me one day, she said, if I can at least keep peanut butter and saltine crackers here, we'll have something to eat. Wow. No matter what happens, we'll have something to eat. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Peanut butter doesn't go bad. You can store it anywhere. Same thing with saltine crackers. You can get protein and everything else. And I know I'm not trying to go off on a tangent here or on a rant. But what you just said was so beautiful because we don't, as a country, we're, we're all, we've been always taught the last 30 years is to go bigger, go better, make improvements, do this, do that. And we haven't learned the real meaning of being good stewards. And that's to store up, put aside, invest so that when... It's like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. When the waves came in and the winds blew, his house stayed. And so mm -hmm. I, I got to ask you this real quick. What's the one area in the five circles of life that you find people most struggle in? Is it finances? Oh, man. Um, it's a blend of two things. I would say the number one that you know people will reach out to us about and ask about uh, especially Brandon, uh, when he was on the show and, and he still gets this is family. So how, how do I get my wife to pay attention to me or notice I'm here? How do I parent my kids in this time of, you know, chaos and just information flying faster than we can process. Uh, but then if you dig deeper, some of the things that are underlying are, I, I feel like I've got the golden handcuffs on. So, uh, I make great money, but we're also like up to our eyeballs. I, I know, of course, my hand went higher than my eyeballs. But if you're listening, you didn't see that. You, only if you're on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> so not important, Jerry. Get back on track. Okay, here I am. I'm back. Uh, so the golden handcuffs. You know, I have this great job. I have great income coming in. But if I look at my finances, 
yeah, we, we got car payments, two of them. We've got a mortgage. Uh, we've got credit card debt. And those are the things keeping me from pursuing my dream or going to a job that I actually would enjoy. So I go to work every single day to not me. Uh, so Steve, if you're listening to this episode, not me, because <laughs> he always, he always kind of has a little panic attack. Like Jerry, are you talking about us? I'm like, no, I'm not talking about us. Uh, I'm talking about our folks who are listening in right now. Uh, so anyway, that, that's kind of the, the struggle that folks have. If it's not their family itself that they're addressing, then if we dig a little bit deeper, some of the things that are holding them back and, and causing some of this friction is this, I'm stuck in this great job, or I'm stuck in this good job, I should say. I'm not pursuing this great thing that's on my heart. And it's because we have these golden handcuffs on. So there we go, landed that plane. Whew. I love that, not pursuing <laughs> the great things on our heart. Oh yeah. Because, you know, again, it, it took me a while to get to, to, to the podcasting thing because I had so many ideas that I wanted to do. And finally, it was just like, you know, when I wrote my book last year and, and did this podcast, it was like, it's either now or never. Just mm -hmm. just go forth and do. Jerry Dugan is my guest here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. When we come back, I'm going to tell his story. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned. Come back with the host of the Beyond the Rut podcast, Jerry Dugan, on the Intentional Encourager podcast back in a moment. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton. Want to tell you about my new book, People Buy From People. 10 Powerful People Lessons from the Ultimate People Person, my dad. My dad was one of the greatest connectors that I ever knew. And he shared with me 10 connecting principles that I have used throughout my 25 year sales and sales management, customer engagement and leadership career that I'm passing along to you. If you want to be a stronger deeper and more powerful connector, you've got to pick up a copy of People Buy From People. There are concepts in there that you may not realize help make you a power connector. You can go to Amazon and pick it up, Kindle if you're an e-reader and you like to do it that way, or now available on Audible. And there's one other way you can get a copy of People Buy From People. You can get one from me and I'll sign it for you. You go to intentionalmediaandpublishing at gmail.com and send me an email. And I'll share with you the link on how you can get a signed copy. You can buy a signed copy directly from me. Again, people buy from people. If you want to connect like never before, pick up your copy today of people buy from people. And now let's get back to more great conversation here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Jerry, let's get to your story. And, and you've teased it a little bit about being deployed to Iraq and uh, moving away from your family. But take me as far back as you want to take me, go from point A to today, and just talk about your story, some of the things you've overcome in your life and challenges that you've overcome and some lessons you've learned from it. And I want to give you the floor to just tell your story. All right, let me let me try the one minute version here. So, uh, my dad, uh, gosh, he's from California. He was in the army. Met my mom uh, while he was stationed in Thailand. So basically, uh, his platoon sergeant or his boss had a wife who was kind of the meddling type, and said, "Hey, Bruce, or I think she called him Dugan at the time because military culture. Uh, you need a wife. I have a sister. You two should meet." And so. That, that's a short version. So they wound up meeting. My dad fell in love. Uh, turns out my, my mom, though, not so much. She actually was seeing somebody else at the time. And um, yeah, uh, what wound up happening was my dad kind of got into an arranged marriage where uh, my grandmother said, okay, cool. Well, the dowry is this. My dad paid the dowry. And then that was it. My parents were married. And uh, so that was 1974 give or take. And a couple years later, I was born in, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I grew up in army brat. Uh, two years after I was born, we added a, a backup child, I guess, to the family. So my little brother, he, he's okay. His name's Jimmy. Um, but I don't know why he's the favorite, but it'll be okay. I'll get over it someday. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, it's I know the way I feel about this, my so. two younger sisters. You know, <laughs> I told my mom when I told my mom recently, I said, you and dad should have stopped at one. 
but my brother, he's got a good heart. Uh, he's he's a bit of a pain in the butt, uh, but big heart, and and he wears it on his sleeve. Uh, so yeah, by 1978, we're a family of four. Uh, we lived in Germany, Japan, California. Uh, so moved around about every two to three years. And then when I was 11. Um, we were kind of hit with a doozy. So, you know, I'm growing up in a family where we have the stereotypical tiger mom from Thailand. So, you know, I'm expected to have straight A's in school, no matter what, I'm going to grow up and be a doctor. I'm going to join the army, become an officer. Uh, these are the things being poured into me day in and day out. Uh, my mom had me reading at a young age. Um, but I mean, some of, so those are good things. I mean, you know, they go to school, get a good job you know, go to school, get good grades, get a good job and retire someday. Uh, my mom was already planting that into my head. Whereas my dad more laid back is like, you know, I love you, son, do what you want to do in life. Um, so those are kind of coming together, but my mom was, there was a strict darker side to her. So, you know, if I got 98% on a test, uh, rather than her saying, great job, I heard you got the highest score in the class or, you know, Hey, great job. You know, that's, that's, a nice solid grade to have uh, my mom would be more like what happened to the other two points go study you, you, you're slacking off and so like if it wasn't a hundred it wasn't a grade you know and that was kind of that pursuit of perfectionism that my mom was also instilling in me and that took some time to be able to accept to give myself grace for failure and for mistakes and to learn from mistakes do you think she got that from your grandparents do you think oh. it was a cultural thing because oh, I, I don't know how you how much exposure you had to your Thai grandparents, but do you see that now that you're in your forties and you go, man, that, that, that has to be cultural because I had a oh, yeah. friend whose parents were from South Korea and all through school, he, he, he was in the same grade. I was, his sister was in the same grade. My sister was, and it was the exact same thing. It was perfection, perfection, perfection. Oh yeah. You know, and, and he was the Dean of the business school at Marshall. So when I was in school and my buddy was off in another school, he would come find me and go, you study hard, you get good grades. And he was the Dean of the business school. I'm like, what was I supposed to do? <laughs> go, no, Dr. Kim, I'm going to slack off. I'm going to do what I want to do is because your kid's not here. And you've known me since I was 10. You just, you know, but did you feel like it was a, a cultural thing with your grandparents just passed on to your, to your mom and your mom was passing? Like, this is the rite of passes. This is what I'm supposed oh, yeah. to do because it was done to me. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of pressure. It, now I don't know all Asian cultures, but I mean, from what I've seen when I lived in Japan and knowing some folks who are Japanese and their upbringing, uh, Vietnamese friends of mine, uh, Chinese friends of mine, Korean, uh, and, and of course being half Thai, that there is an expectation that you go to school and you excel, you, you achieve in school, you achieve wherever you go, you strive to be the best. Uh, and so there's like the individual expectation that you are the best. And then there's the collective expectation that you're the best for the greater good, for the family, uh, for the community and so on. So very collective in that respect. And, and then on the flip side, you know, it's, it's a unique take on keeping up with the Joneses. So in the United States, we keep up with the Joneses by getting material items, the flashy car, the flashy house, the flashy clothes, the flashy gadgets, uh, in the culture or the upbringing I received, the perspective I've got is, uh, we keep up with the Joneses by having a kid who's smarter than your kid. And then that somehow is the measure of, um, status or achievement. It's like, yeah. my kid is smarter than your kid because I'm smarter than you. And it, yeah. it's, it, it's a weird, uh, kind of thing. So it, it's awkward though, being an Americanized child growing up and I'm being compared to other people's kids right there in front of my friends. Like my friends and I just want to play outside and here are our parents going to town on who's got the most achievements. And then as we go off to our separate homes, then, you know, mom is putting more pressure on the child. You got to go and study. You got to read more. You so Jerry, the was there yeah. conflict in your home? Because you mentioned your dad was, was really laid back and he's like, I love you, son. You know, you, you know, you do you, you, mm -hmm. you be what you're supposed to be. And your mom is over here going study, study, study the two points, you know, you should have gotten a hundred. Did you ever feel the conflict at times between your parents and the ideologies that they had for how you should be raised or, or um, 
I mean, because I would have to think that there there was, I mean, there's obviously competing forces there, right? That yeah. that you know, this is the way mom grew up. This is the way dad was, and and it's almost like you know, butting heads, so to speak. Did you ever feel that or see that? Um, I didn't see it directly. So my parents never argued in front of us. Um, my dad did a lot of deference. So, uh, you know, when it came to different styles of parenting, uh, my dad would oftentimes just defer and let my mom have the, the say, uh, where he would step in, he would never directly step in like while she's in mid like disciplining mode. Um, but he would play the good cop afterward. So, uh, you know, if, if I got, you know, a, a spanking and a hard talking to, um, he was there with a hug, you know, like not right away. Cause I'd be sent to my room, but at some point I knew I could go to him, just get a hug and, and, and that would be that, but he wouldn't say anything that countered what my mom had said or decided. Uh, and then with my brother though, there was a little bit more leniency. So it was almost like the compromise, like, all right, I'll rate, you know, my mom would be like, I'll raise Jerry the way I see fit. Uh, you can raise Jimmy the American lazy way. <laughs> I'm sure she said that a few times that way. So my, my brother was a little bit more Americanized in how he was brought up. I'm almost to, to an exaggerated point um, because my mom had this kind of caricature of American culture in her head. Uh, so there was that. Um, and then, and, you know, at night we can hear my mom like whispering very sternly to my dad. And my dad's just kind of like, okay, okay. Uh, now that did build up over time because... Uh, I think by the time I was 11 years old, my mom felt like she wasn't being heard, probably not feeling loved because of that. Uh, and my dad, of course, kind of oblivious to it all. Like he thought, Hey, I provide for my family. I provide for my kids. I have a home I come to every day. Um, I dote on my wife, you know, everything's fine. Uh, but the reality is my, my mom had some insecurities about her so that, uh, it didn't take much for my mom to be kind of tricked out of the family. So, um, so fast forwarding to like when I'm 11 years old now, um, my dad had orders to go to Germany, uh, but the orders were supposed to have the whole family on it. Uh, it turns out there's a housing shortage. So he has to go to Germany, scramble to get housing for us uh, through the government, through the army and get his orders amended so he can bring his wife and two sons with him. And this took maybe two or three months, maybe two months. It wasn't a whole long uh, period of time. But in that time, uh, my mom is working at the officer's club on the army post. And, um, this is around the time that the movie top gun had come out. And there were a group of Apache helicopter pilots who really thought it was cool to have the, uh, on the premises bet going on. And so they basically saw my mom and said, Hey, I bet one of us, you know, I bet we basically go out with her. And the bet was for like one month's paycheck. Uh, and this all came out over the next few weeks or, or months as this unfolded. And my dad had to dig in like what happened. Uh, and of course, this is the story as it's come to me over the years uh, from both my parents. Uh, so essentially, one of the guys said, I'll, I'll go for it. And they all, it was like four of them all together who bet one month's paycheck. Uh, so there were a few thousand dollars on the line for this guy. Uh, and so he goes forward and basically fills my mom's head with the idea that uh, my dad's in Germany with a girlfriend right now, because that's what all soldiers do. You know, we go on TDY, we deploy with our wives. We have special friendships and relationships. Uh, and he's like me, I've got one or two of these myself and I've got a family. And, uh, and I, and so he just kind of built this idea that, you know, it's okay for us to go out because your husband's over there in Germany doing the same thing. So she does. And he just dotes on her, this guy. Uh, and so eventually she decides I'm not going to Germany with my husband. And in fact, my sons can go with my husband. Uh, I'm going to stay here and I've got this great thing going on. So that actually split up my family, uh, this one bet and my mom's, you know, feeling insecure and kind of falling for this guy's, um, doting on her. And so now only am I now dealing with the separation of my parents going to Germany, uh, which I was excited about. Uh, this is the kind of thing that drove my dad to suicidal tendencies. So he is now uh, suicidal, holding knives to his chest, trying to overdose on antidepressants. And, and I'm 11 years old at the time. My brother's nine and we're doing everything in our power to uh, keep him from succeeding at suicide, but also making sure that nobody finds out because the thing we did not want is to be sent back to my mom, uh, whose boyfriend definitely did not want us in the picture. 
So we kind of imagined ourselves being bounced around among family who didn't want us. And so we were like, this is our best bet for survival. My brother and I is to keep my dad alive. And so that was, that was Germany. That was life at 11 years old. And, uh, we eventually, uh, kind of succeeded by failing, you know, cause I mean, what can an 11 year old do to prevent suicide? I don't know. Um, but yeah, my dad actually almost succeeded. He had hung himself with a rope and we have, you know, I was like, how did he find that? Uh, fortunately the, the clip on the rope snapped, uh, he survived, but it gave him a rope burn on his neck that he couldn't hide when he went back to work the next day. Uh, and he got the help he needed. The army was at the time, not big on drumming people out. They did everything in their power to keep you in. And so he finally got the help that he needed. Uh, we stayed with an aunt and uncle of mine, the same aunt and uncle who got my parents together in the first place. And I think within about four months, we were re reunited with my dad. Uh, he got restationed to California to be closer to his family. And, uh, so yeah, we went with them. That was at 11 years old. Woohoo. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. But it didn't stop there. I mean, it, it turns out, uh, my extended family were also experiencing two or three other divorces in the family. So you have a couple of uncles who are also, um, distraught in pain and all they knew what to do was to take it out on other people. Uh, I had some cousins going through that same process. And, uh, so from about 11 years old to about 14 years old, now that we've kind of gotten out of this shadow of my dad attempting suicide, uh, I'm now under this cloud of, uh, a family who is so hurt that the, the racist tendencies are now coming out of them. So I'm getting called names like gook, nip, Jap, chink, half breed, boat person, um, all the wrong racial slurs for being a Thai person. But, um, and I would just kind of egg them on like, you guys realize how dumb you are. Like Thai people are not Japs. They're, those are Japanese. Uh, a chink is actually from China and they're like, Oh, you're Mr. Smarty pants. And then they beat me up. And, uh, so it ultimately came down to a fight between myself and a 30 something year old uncle of mine. Uh, and, and me going into hiding for the rest of the day when my dad finally realized, okay, I'm exposing my son to this kind of abuse from my own family. So finally at like 13, 14 years old, he's like, all right, son, you don't have to come to grandma and grandpa's house anymore. Um, and if you don't claim them as family, I'm okay with that. Uh, I still have to go up cause I'm working on the side there, but you don't have to go. And that's when I kind of drew a line in the sand uh, because I, I saw the path that my uncles were going down and uh, that my cousins were going down and th it was just very heavy. You know, that's, uh, and so I, I just, I knew I, there was more to life than divorce. There was more to life than living on welfare. Um, and we can have better career aspirations than, uh, drop out of high school, get emancipated from my parents at 16 and draw SSI as income. And, and so that was the line on the sand. And I just, I remember writing notes into Christmas cards and giving them out to family and just telling them, I want to prove to you that we can change the name and what people think of when they hear the last name Dugan, uh, that we're not followed around in stores as shoplifters, that uh, we can excel in school, that we can get careers that uh, support our families and that we can have families that last. And so that was the, the intent at 14 years old, that I was going to change the trajectory of the Dugan family. Uh, and I also learned around the same time that we had a motto that goes, there's a Dugan crest. It's an Irish name. And so like any good family in the UK, they've got a history, they've got a unit, their family crest. And, uh, turns out there's a motto that goes with the Dugan family crest and it's with virtue and valor. And I latched onto that. I was like, I want to live my life with virtue and valor. It's on our crest. It's a motto. If we're going to say that's part of who we are, I'm going to live it. And wow. So that was at 14 years old. Was that the impetus for you to, to, to join the army or was it, was it always in the back of your mind to go, I'm going to do what dad did? Because he, here's why I say that people ask me, they say, well, how did you get into sales? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I started out as a broadcast journalism major. Ironic. I do a podcast now that, you know, 31 years later, I started out to be a sports play by play guy and then a sports writer and then decided to get into sales because that's what my dad did. That's what I grew up around. You grew up in an army family. Was that the impetus for you to join the army or, or was it seeing the sacrifices that, that people made to defend freedom and defend their country? 
Oddly enough, it was neither. <laughs> uh, now, granted, with that, uh, army brats, military brats, there is a high proportion of us who, as we grow up into adulthood, uh, that go into public service of some kind. Uh, I forget the statistic, but if you compare it to a non-military child, uh, it is significantly higher. I think two to three times higher than those who did not grow up in that setting. And so yeah, higher rate of those who go into like public service as teachers, firefighters, first responders, military, government, and so on. Uh, and so there is that influence there. Um, but when I went off to college, I was, I was actually recruited to be a tuba performance major. Uh, but the last minute I thought, you can't save the world and change the world as a tuba player. Um, <laughs> at least, Boy. yeah, you know, it, unless aliens come and it turns out that's the way to communicate to the aliens, like in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah. 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 Uh, I actually studied under the guy who studied under the guy who played the spaceship. So total side note, not that important, uh, but uh, coming back to that, I, I just thought, what can I do that is noble, that'll save lives, change the world? And the only thing I knew was what my mom had drilled into me. You're going to join the, you know, you're going to, you're going to be an officer in the army. You're going to be a doctor. I was like, well, I'm not going to join the army. I'm a pacifist. I'm not, I don't want to take lives. Um, but this doctor thing, let me explore that. And so I was a pre-med student in college. Uh, I was a guy who tutored folks to get 3.5 GPAs and higher, but my own GPA was like a 2.1, a 2.3, somewhere in there. I took organic chemistry for about, for about two years. I, I took that long route with organic chemistry. Uh, so my grades said, I'm not going to medical school. Um, and then I was out of money. I, I borrowed as much as I could borrow. I had spent as much as I, as I could spend. And it was like, how do I get my grades up so I can go back to medical school? I'm like, I, I don't know. And how do I get the experience needed to offset this GPA that really sucks? And so I just did my, I kind of looked around. I'm like, oh, on top of that, I've been going to school for like a long time and I want to travel and I want to see the world. So I need a job to pay for school and training and I want to see the world. Who can offer that? And then I was talking to my dad that night. I'm like, wait a sec, army. And so I went, I, I talked to an army recruiter because, um, you know, Marine Corps, they, they run too fast. I didn't like to run, uh, air force. I thought wasn't really tough because I didn't know about like pararescue. And I didn't know about like the, the guys who jump in with the special forces guys and do the air traffic control stuff. Um, but I also didn't know about their medical services until I was already committed to the army and in the Navy. I, I just have this fear of drowning. Uh, yeah, I don't want to drown. So that, yeah. that avoided there and, or, or being eaten by sharks. Mm -hmm. I just saw the, the documentary about the USS in Indianapolis. I'm like, yeah, no, that's not happening. Uh, so the army was the way to go. I wanted to be a trauma doctor and who has the most history of creating and treating traumatic wounds, the army. So that, that was why I enlisted in the army was to be a medic, see the world and get paid while I got trained and, and get some experience in the healthcare field. So that, that's actually what drove me to join the army because my dad actually told me, do whatever you want in life, son, just don't join the army. And he told me that before I went off to college. And of course, four and a half years later, dad, I joined the army and, uh, he didn't say he was disappointed, but it was the only time he had nothing to say for about 60 seconds. Wow. So, yeah. And, and <laughs> take me in, in the interest of time, take me through getting deployed to Iraq because again, it's the early 2000s. We had just yeah. come through 9-11 and, and we were ramping up our military efforts in the Middle East. Take me through that time in your life and, and talk about a couple of things uh, you experienced over there in, in Iraq. Yeah. So uh, by this time, uh, so I joined in 1999, uh, got married to Olivia uh, in 2001. In fact, we met in the Army. She was in the Army as well. Um, 9-11 happened and we knew we were now in a state of war. Uh, we had a son on the way and we just knew, okay, um, let, let, let's get, let's get hitched. <laughs> let's get married. Uh, my wife wanted to get out of the army because I mean, she didn't want her son to grow up without parents. So, uh, that was another decision was let's, let's have at least one parent present. Uh, let's get married and, um, let's do this thing. So, uh, so I'm with third infantry division from 2001 to 2003. And at the end of, or at the end of my enlistment, the start of 2003, we get deployment orders to go to Kuwait. And so we're part of that whole buildup phase. And 
um, I'm coming close on needing to either re-enlist or get out. And my boss basically said to me, hey, uh, Sergeant Dugan, if you choose not to re-enlist in the next couple of weeks and nothing happens in theater, uh, we'll go ahead and send you home and you can out process and have a good life. Uh, but if you decide to re-enlist, hey, we'd be, we'd be glad to have you here. And the two weeks came by and, and went and I decided, I, th I think I'm done. Personality wise, uh, you guys don't like the fact that I smile a lot, that I'm always Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky and Mr. Positive Silver Lining. You want me to yell at people and then when I yell at people, you get mad at me for yelling at people. So uh, I think it's probably just a good idea for me to get out and pursue the thing that I had on my mind, which is to be a doctor someday. So yeah, pack up all my extra gear, put it on a truck and two or three days later, we have a formation. So all 700 soldiers gathered together. And I, as I'm walking to the formation, my bags that I packed just a few days before are, are on the ground. I'm like, huh, that's weird. Interesting. That formation, uh, looked like a reenlistment. So somebody was reenlisting, getting their, you know, tax-free dollars and tax-free bonus. And I'm like, all right, cool. And then I realized there's nobody up there. So who is reenlisting? And then as the reenlistment NCO is reading the reenlistment orders to everybody, he just says a blanket statement, all personnel with an end of term of service date, ETS date, uh, in the year 2003 are hereby extended in service with a new end of term of service date of December 25th, 2024. And I just realized I just got stop lost. We're going to war. Ah, uh, Wow. All right. I've seen the movies. Who dies in war? The guy who's supposed to get out soon. Well, it was a good run. I, had, you know, I wasn't a Christian yet at the time. And so I just, I kind of knew like, I'm not going to come out of this alive. Um, this is it. And I need to tell my wife that I love her. And so deployment was anywhere between the reading of these orders, which was February until the time of president Bush's choosing. And, um, uh, so yeah, I, I remember picking up the phone, trying to call my wife, but communications at the time sucked. So I'd pick up the phone, get a dial tone, put it back or not a dial tone, a busy signal. And then that went on for nine minutes and I finally get a connection. I dial home. My wife picks up on the other end and she wants to know where I've been, why I haven't been calling. And, and she's like unaware that I've been, um, you know, out in the field a lot. Cause now we're training to go to war. And just as I'm getting ready to tell her, I love her that we got stop lost. I got one minute to talk. A guy taps me on the shoulder and says, Hey, you know, when you're done with your call, can you go ahead and just like not hang up, just hit these buttons. And then that'll keep the connection for me to be able to call my wife when, when the time comes and I'm, I'm coming to your table and he's eating up my time. Like I got 60 seconds to tell my wife, I love her. I'm good. You know, and I hope that everything's, that everything's going to be okay. And I'll talk to her as soon as possible. And here's this random stranger telling me to give up my time so that he can have his full 10 minutes with his wife. And, uh, now my wife to this day still remembers that, that I chose to talk to a total stranger. And I'm like, I did not choose that guy tapped me on the shoulder and started talking. And I, and I was like, are you kidding me? And so I had to like put my hand up and tell him, Hey, can you step back? I got 30 seconds to tell my wife I love her. And so sure enough, I turned to my wife and she's like, not happy about this. And so I had to tell her, Liv, I just got stop lost. We're going out to the field again in the next few days. I don't know when I'll be able to talk to you again. I love you so much. Everything's going to be okay. And just as that was said, I hear time's up, hang up the phones. And I look at this guy who tapped me on the shoulder. And I probably did the most vengeful thing I've ever done. And I hung that phone up and I gave him a little shoulder bump. I was like, don't you ever interrupt a soldier again when he's calling home for the last time. And off I went. Um, and that was it. I didn't get to talk to my wife for another gosh month. Wow. Um, and yeah, the, the, the war kicked off. We invaded Iraq. I was with the first battalion, 10th field artillery as a medic. And, uh, within that battalion, I was with Bravo battery and, um, we were with 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzers. So artillery, uh, just one of our rounds will kill everything on a football field. And just to give you an idea of the unit I was with, the hundred and some odd guys I was with, with Bravo Battery, uh, the first of the 10th Field Artillery, um, I believe our battalion, our, yeah, our battalion fired around some, like something like 65 or 6,200 rounds. Uh, and so that's 6,200 football fields. 
my battery alone, our six cannons out of the three cannons fired about 3,500 of those rounds. So out of the three of uh, bat batteries, mine fired more than half that the battalion fired. And I believe our one battery fired uh, something like, I think third infantry division fired something like 13,000 artillery rounds. And again, we fired out of eight, I think, let's, let me do the math here. One, two, three, about nine to 12 batteries. My one battery fired again, 3,500 of those rounds. So if you do the math percentage wise, we did a lot of shooting and, and a lot of, uh, destruction. Um, so we get to Baghdad because we're told the only way home is through Baghdad. Um, and I think I loaded more rounds or helped transfer more rounds than to the point where all the rookies thought I was an ammo chief, not a, not a medic. So a uh, little, little humorous part there, but we, yeah, we get to Baghdad. Uh, we haven't lost anybody. We've gone through two firefights where we were getting shot at, um, a couple of moments in there that, again, not a Christian, but there were a couple of moments during those two firefights where I'm getting ready to run from point A to point B. And before I run, I hear somebody shout out behind me, doc. And I turn around and there's nobody there. And I don't tell this story a whole lot because it's, it sounds so weird. But when I turn back around to run, like I was going to run, bullets are kicking up where I would have been had I taken off running and somebody didn't call me. Wow from behind that happened twice, uh, once in both, um, um, firefights and yeah, I thought nothing of it. I just thought, well, somebody had to have called me, you know, that somebody surely, and I'd ask around and nobody, everybody's like, no, we're good. Nobody's hurt. Why would we call you doc? You know, we, we yell medic if we need you during a firefight. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. That's what I thought. Um, so yeah, I thought nothing of it. We get to Baghdad. Uh, we are at the Republican guard compound. And I mean, we're, we're so undermanned and we got like looters coming inside the compound. And so myself, uh, actually there's a Sergeant who needs a patrol to go around and, and send these looters out. And, uh, so anyway, I'm one of the three guys. So I had to like switch hats. I'm not a medic right now. I'm a soldier and I need to like scare the local population into not coming here. And so the people of Iraq saw the worst side of me, uh, where I would like, strip people of their clothes, set the, the clothes on fire, burn their money in front of them, um, threaten to shoot the husbands in front of their families, you know, everything short of actually killing anybody, uh, because we were there to liberate the country, not be tyrants. Uh, but none of it was working. And then, um, our sister platoon showed up and they took a whole different strategy of, why don't we just be nice to the locals and see what they need? I'm like, no, they're looting. We need to chase them out and not be near us because we don't know which ones are actually trying to kill us because uh, there were some who had guns and they had knives and they had vans pull up filled with AK-47s. And so that was the world I was seeing. And these guys show up, our sister platoon, and they're like, hey, what do you guys need? What would keep you from coming in here unannounced? And they're like, well, we want these aluminum rods that are in that warehouse there. Can we buy them off of you? And we're like, Hey, to be honest, we don't care about those rods. What do you want to use them for? They're like, well, if we just sell one rod, that'll feed my family for like five or six months. And we're like, there's a lot of rods back there. Can you get some trucks and just get it out of here on one trip? And they're like, yeah, what do you guys need? Well, none of us have called home in the last month. Do you have any satellite phones? And, and so like they did a trade and they're like, you want any more than that? Like cash? And I'm like, no, 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 no. We, that would be a good favor to us. We'll give you some access here that to have stuff that doesn't belong to us. This belongs to the people of Iraq. So that was it. That was the last time we had like looters, like come into our compound. And I was like, so it was like a lesson learned. Like you, you get more flies with honey, I guess. Um, you know, you, you get further along with politeness rather than pain and fear. And, uh, and even during like one of the last times I was, confronting some looters. I remember a soldier from that sister platoon re walking up to me and just asking, Hey, Sergeant, what are you, what are you doing? And he was, he was like a brand new private, a uh, brand new kid. And I was like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm, I'm protecting us. Now you want to help me or do you want to join them? Uh, but he just, you know, he just kept asking like, why are you burning their clothes? Why are you doing this to them? Like he just asked why questions. And then of course I'm thinking, why is he questioning a Sergeant in the U S army? And, uh, but then he, he kind of walked away. He let me kind of finish what I was doing, but just those questions alone, it, it shut me down. I was like, you know, what am I doing? 
my daughter was born today and here I am, you know, scaring a whole family of people who are just trying to, I don't know, take care wow. of themselves. And so I released them. I was like, go. And I, I kicked them out of the hole that they created on my wall and I filled up the wall myself. And, uh, yeah, I just cried in my, my room, uh, in my little post. And, uh, I was like, gosh, you know, th I'm a monster. This, this cannot come home. And, um, was that the moment that things changed? And, and I want to, for the interest of time for our listeners, was was that a lesson that you took from that time there that really transformed you into into what you? Because I I'm I'm watching you and, and those on YouTube, I'm watching you tell this story, <laughs> and it's like, man, that was a powerful moment for you. Was that yeah. the biggest lesson that you took away from that time over there? Um. It was the biggest pivot point, I would say. Uh, and, and yes, I mean, I still think about that time to this day because uh, now prior to this, prior to the invasion kicking off, uh, and again, I wasn't a Christian and, and I remember making a prayer and it was more like a deal. And, and this is like March 19th, 2003. And I, I know this because it's the day that we started the invasion. And I remember saying, God, if you're real, um, you better replace me with somebody who will love my wife better than I did and who will raise my children as if they were his own. Um, I didn't say amen. I didn't say help me or save me. I just said, if you're real, you will replace me with someone better who would take care of my family as if they were his own. And that was it. I just told God what he needed to do. And then you fast forward to June or July, 2003. And here's this 18, 19 year old kid challenging my behavior. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And it, that's it. There was no argument. There was no, I'm going to report you. He just dropped those questions. And the thing I remember most about him, other than his like surrender and submission to let the sergeant have his way was he had a necklace hanging out of his uniform, which is a big no go. You're not supposed to have any jewelry hanging out of your uniform. And it was a cross. And I was like, I was like tempted to just yell at him for being out of uniform. Um, but again, see now knowing what I know, and having been a Christian since 2005, uh, it, it's like, wow, okay, God used that kid to come up to me and plant some seeds that instantaneously made me stop what I was doing. Because that was the last time I took that tactic with anybody uh, while I was in Baghdad. From then on, it was calm, demeanor, um, and, and it got me through the rest of the deployment. Because I think a month later, we came back to Kuwait. And, and of course, in my head, I'm like, God, uh, I didn't die. So I guess you're off the hook. You don't have to replace me with somebody who's better. Um, but I was pretty sure I was, I was a dead man. Uh, wow. That is, so we get, that's powerful. Oh, that is man. so yeah. powerful. I, I appreciate you going deep with that. And, and again, folks, we went a little long there, but there's a lot to pull out of that. Jerry, as we wrap up this, our time together, man, you've been so great with your time today. And I, I, you shared a powerful story with the listeners share with them your biggest piece of intentional encouragement. Biggest piece of intentional encouragement is, uh, in this world, you've only got one life. You only got one shot at it and it is too dang short to live it stuck in a rut. So, uh, whatever it is that you want to be in life, the type of husband you want to be, the type of father you want to be, the, the type of business person you want to be, do that now. Don't wait for the perfect conditions. Don't wait for somebody to do it for you. Go be that man now. That's it. Wow. That is so good. Man, I have enjoyed our time together. Uh, thank you for will being willing to go long, a little deeper in, into, to your, into your life. And I, I knew this would be worth it. Tell folks how they can connect with you and, and find the Beyond the Rut podcast. Awesome. Uh, the best place to go is the website beyond the rut.com. And there you'll find links to the show. Uh, in fact, if you click on the blog and podcast tab, that'll go to every single episode we've ever published since 2015. Uh, also on the homepage are all the links to where this show is available on your favorite podcast player. Our contact information is there. Uh, we're on Facebook beyond the rut. We're on Instagram beyond the rut. Also on Twitter beyond the rut. 
check that out. But if you go to beyondtherut.com, that's where you'll find all that information. Beyond the Rut on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Jerry Dugan, man, this has been tremendous. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for having me on the Beyond the Rut podcast. And thank you for being on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be on here, Brian. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Means. And of course, the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. If you're not subscribed to the Intentional Encourager podcast, hit the subscribe button wherever you get podcasts so you don't miss an exciting episode where you can get encouraged and stay encouraged. And remember, anyone, anywhere, at any time, any place can be an intentional encourager.